Good morning, everybody. So lovely to see you all. And uh, thank you for the price that you're paying to take off your precious time to hear something more of the Word of God and hopefully to be changed through His Word. Thank you for the privilege of being able to share with you. My wife and I count it an absolute privilege. And we, we celebrate this opportunity. So, I'd like to start with, with a very brief recap of last night's message. Because I did say last night was the broad strokes. And then this morning is going to be more unpacking some of the detail of the wineskin. So, um, last night I shared about the wine and the wineskin, which was Jesus' end time plan to fulfill the Great Commission. The only way we can fill the Great Commission is through the church and through the life of Christ. We can't do it through any other way. That's the end time strategy. Everything else must supplement that, but it can never replace it. The primary way to fulfill our commission is through the wine, the life of Jesus, ministering to the world through his church. There is no other way. And it will never change until the end of the age. And then our job will be done on the earth. So that's the thing. And then I went through, and I want to recap this a little bit more intensely. I went through the fact that much of what we know and understand about church, we've learned through traditions, through our parents, through things that we've been exposed to in our lives. And so most of us, even when we become Christians, have got a pre program thought of the various things of church and church structure and church leadership. So much so that we come into the church with our ideas that what we think the church is, is biblical. Because it's what we've been brought up with or what we've been exposed to. So most people have got pre-programmed ideas on, on terminology that, we've, that we talk about, like deacons. Depends on your background. If I throw out the word deacon, some people want to run out the door. Because they think of some things they remember of what the job of a deacon was. Depends on their background. I know some of them, their job was to go door to door and collect the tarts, you know. And uh, so you say deacons, and you might get anxiety just at the word. Some think of elders, and they might have a concept of elders that um, they've learned from somewhere or other that the elders were like this committee that, that uh, got together and it was selected from all the, the most prominent people in, in the church, you know, so all the people with high positions in society became the elders and those kind of things. And so we've got all these things that we've grown up with and some may have terminologies of duimini and we've got terminologies of bishop and we've got terminologies of apostle and um, all these things, but we've learned them predominantly, I'm not saying I'm generalizing, but we've learned them predominantly from what we've seen around us and what we've been exposed to in our upbringing. Now, the difference was with the early church is they had a blank slate. But when the church was planted, there was nothing. There was a blank slate. And on that blank slate, the Holy Spirit, through the apostles in the New Testament uh, writing times and through Paul, I mean later as an apostle, they could imprint on the hearts of the people the wineskin in its pure form without any baggage. And so now we, in our day, have got the problem is that for centuries, the wineskin has been adapted and changed and all along. And I've been studying the development of church leadership in the era past the New Testament writings. And it was amazing to me to see how quickly Within the first two centuries after the writing, after the last you know, revelation was written by John, like plus minus 90 AD, from that point on it took just two centuries for the whole hierarchical structure of church to be in place as the normal standard. And so it went very quickly, and very quickly the terminology I spoke about last night was tip, 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 tip like this, and eventually you had these hierarchical structures. And out of the hierarchical structures that came in, um, there was the reaction to that, to uh, no structure things. And so history unfolded. And so we've got all the denominations and churches around with all kinds of different ideas about how to structure church. And so 
the quest that I have is to say, don't listen to Alan's view or Alan's structure, but to try and, in a sense, say, let's try and put aside our, our preconceived concepts of the terminology around church structure. And let's try to the best of our ability to say, but what does the scripture teach plainly and simply? For somebody that's not a super expert theologian, just to go to the Bible and to say, but what is, what is in here? Without trying to be fancy, but just what is the plain, simple instruction? And that is where I find one of the most powerful, simple verses that sums it up is Philippians chapter 1. So I'd love you to open your Bible there today. And somebody, I think it was Dudley Daniel, once said, if we're going to if we're going to go on, we have to first unlearn some things and then we have to relearn them in the right way before we can go on. So I, I'm wanting to ask you, and I, I love what Shannon did, to put your hand on your heart. I'm not asking you to do it again. But in a sense, we need our, our hearts to unlearn things that maybe we've thought they're biblical because we just saw it happening as how we were brought up and eventually we think it's in the Bible. But if it's not in there, to say to your heart, let it go. Let it go. And let us adopt what we see in the Bible. And the reason is, is I now use the, the, um, the picture of Noah's ark. Noah built the ark exactly according to the pattern that God gave him. And when the flood came, it could ride the flood. If we're going to build differently, we don't know what floods are coming. It could be floods of persecution. It could be floods of revival. It could be floods of all kinds of circumstantial challenges. But if we build according to the pattern, we're guaranteed it will ride the flood. Another example is from the time of David. I just want to briefly mention that. We sometimes have the concept, and I found it even from theologians, they say don't bother too much about leadership structure, just sort of adapt it as you feel. And there is a kind of thing, if it works, do it. And so, so if, we've, if we've got titles and all kinds of things we don't find in the Bible, if it works, just do it, and it's fine. So don't tamper with something that works. You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So we have that approach. But David, King David from the Old Testament, he wanted to bring the Ark of the Covenant back into the city, which is a picture of what the task of the church is. We are to bring the presence of God into the dark places of our world. We want to carry that. But he didn't consult the scriptures that came through Moses about how it should be done. Instead, he looked and he saw something that worked well for the Philistines. They used ox carts to transport heavy stuff. So he said, this, this Ark of the Covenant, you know what, it was quite a heavy thing. It was overlaid with gold and all these kind of things. And so he said, instead of us you know, bothering with carrying this thing, let's put it on an ox cart and we'll really impress God. We'll get a brand new ox cart. We put it on a new ox cart and we get fresh oxen to pull it. And so he, he planned it all like that. Isn't it the mindset of our day? We look around and we say, look, in business or in society or in government, it works like that. So it's working. So let's, let's just upgrade it a bit and make it smart for God and we'll do it here in the church just like they're doing it. And that's often the approach that one takes. So David did this and he puts the Ark of the Covenant on this new ox cart and he starts going along. And the problem is, now they're going along, and the thing hits a bump in the road. And that's what I'm saying, like the flood of Noah. That ox cart works while the road's smooth. It hit a bump in the road. And one of the guys, Uzzah, I think his name was, saw this bump in the road, and he was worried that it was going to fall off the ox cart. So he stretches his hand out to steady it, and God strikes him dead. And David is shocked. God, we're trying to do your work. We're trying to get it right. We're trying to do what you told us to do. You said we must return, return the glory of the Lord to the city. And now we're doing it. Now you strike one of my guys dead. And the Lord said to him, you didn't consult the way I said this must be done. And he said, okay, well, he called all the, the learned guys together. He says, go and search the scriptures. What must we do? They said, no, it shouldn't be carried on an ox cart. It must be carried on the shoulders of the Levites. And so he repented and he mourned for a long time and eventually he said, okay, let's try again. And they picked up the ox cart with the shoulders on the shoulders of a lever. It doesn't look like the best plan. Sometimes the way the church is structured in the scriptures doesn't look like the best plan to us. And so it's working much better. Let's just adapt that. That looks like... 
But we are not to desire. We are to say, but what does the scripture say? To go back to that. God wants his glory to be carried on the shoulders of his people. We are the vessels of his glory in this world. Not our instruments, not how fancy our church is, not what, how we can be flashy in the world. He doesn't want us to copy those kind of systems. He wants us to be bearers of his glory the way he's designed us to be. So I mention those two backgrounds because we've got to have the motivation to let go of old mindsets. Because sometimes we just think, oh, it's always worked like this. We've always done it and we've used these terms and we've used these structures. And so why don't we just leave it? Why are you coming to upset the, the whole thing here? But the fact is, we don't know what's coming. Let's build according to the plan. So I, I re really want to say to people here, sometimes we have a deep affinity to the old things that we've learned and we don't want to let them go because we've got nostalgia, we remember, and we, we're fond of those kind of things, and we want to hold on to them. But we've got to realize we are carrying the most precious gift, the life of Christ. We must make sure our wineskin is one that is according to his design. Not because we might think we might know better, but because we find it in the scriptures. So let's read Philippians 1, and I'm going to read a couple of verses just to give the the, the picture here. But let's start from Philippians 1 verse 1, and I'm reading from the NIV. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and the deacons. And I mentioned last night, if you ever want to know what is the wineskin in one verse, there it is. Everything that you need to structure a church is in Philippians 1 verse 1. You need nothing more, nothing less. You don't have to be clever and figure out all kinds of other positions and roles and structures and titles. There it is. Complete and it doesn't change. This happened 10 years plus into this church's history. Paul was refers to this church as one of the churches close to his heart. And so this is how he had built it over 10 years and we need to understand that there is no modification required. This is the wineskin. And let me point it out to you, and then we'll read on a bit more just now. Paul and Timothy were not members of the church. They were outside people that we can call an apostolic team or an Ephesians 4 team, a gift that worked into the church from outside. Every local church needs to be connected to apostolic or translocal ministry. It's in the wineskin. There it is. So you need those outside role players to come into the life of your church and to speak into the church and to bring the Ephesians 4 gift, which uh, I'll, we'll get to Ephesians 4 just now, but just briefly, the Ephesians 4 ministry is where gifts come into the church and they come in to equip the local church to do the work. They don't do the work for them. They equip the guys in the church to do the work and then they move on and they, the church carries on. So that's Paul and Timothy. So there's the first part of the wineskin. The second part of the wineskin is it says all God's holy people in Philippi. So that is what I call the A-team. The A-team is the whole church. That is the A-team. And it's everybody. Everybody is on the field playing to score the goals. That's the A-team. There aren't people on the bench. There aren't people that are standing on the outside. Um, the church is the A team, everybody. And then it uses these words, together with. That means your leaders are not those that are, in a sense, in a hierarchical structure. They are together with. They're in the team. You, it's almost like on the soccer field, you, the captain of the, of the soccer team is right there on the field. You have to kind of look quite hard. Sometimes they've got an armband or something on to actually just to notice them because he's together with the players on the field. That is the concept that we have here is that the leadership team is together with the saints all together and when you talk about the church it's together with them. Okay so then then it mentions the two officers. I want to call them officers because we read about them in 1 Timothy. There are two Officers in the local church, only two, no more, no less, no other officers in the church. Overseers, which is a word that is interchangeable with the term elder, we look at that just now also, and deacons. 
It's the simplest wineskin. The A team has got elders and it's got deacons. And from time to time, you have your apostolic ministry that you allow to come in to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. It's as simple as that. And when we want to upgrade it and we want to bring all kinds of extra job titles and offices and you get appointed to this and this and this and this, we are then, in a sense, adding on to something that ultimately is not according to the design of the New Testament pattern. Now, let's read on that we can just see what is, the, what is this whole design for. So let's read on. Grace and mercy, verse 2, grace and, and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And there we have it. This word partnership with the gospel means that the local church is in this partnership with this apostolic team together to see the Great Commission fulfilled in what is called a partnership, which means we invest into one another's lives, but we've got a, a common goal, and that's to see this gospel, this life of Christ, the wine dispensed into the world. And we do it in partnership with one another, and we do it in partnership with, with translocal or apostolic team. So there we have it. And so the simplicity of the wineskin is there. And so what has happened is that over time, the various job descriptions that are given to elders has been broken up into different titles and positions. And the same has happened with the translocal gifts or the, the Ephesians 4 gifts have been given titles and give, been given promotions to elevate people. So I mentioned last night that we're going to look at elders and deacons in some more detail. So I'd like to do that and then I'll talk a little bit more about that. So let us start by looking at the term elder and everything flows back to Philippians 1. Elders and deacons, that's it. And so let's have a look at them. And again, I want to ask you to try to let go of your mindsets of these terms from previous experience. Let's try and have a look. What does the Bible say about them? So it's going to be a bit of a traveling through Scripture. So I'd like you to go with me. And uh, let's go back. We did touch on it last night. But let us go back to Acts chapter 14. And... If you can open up your Bibles to Acts 14, around about verse 23. Let's read that together. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. Here we have a few things that we immediately can learn about elders. The first thing that we see that elders are not appointed by other elders. They are appointed by apostolic or translocal, or Ephesian, those are three words I'll interchange. They, use, they are used, they are pointed through apostolic ministry. We see Paul and Barnabas came and they appointed the elders. So we need to see that is a very important uh, thing to realize, is that we don't just have in a local church appointing of elders within the church itself, but we actually see apostolic team coming in to appoint elders. We also see, and I mentioned it last night, that elders were appointed in the plural, so they are appointed as a team. Churches should be led by elders, must be a team. There's a team of elders. And we, the third thing that we see here is that they are appointed in each church, so elders have a, have a authority only over the church where they are appointed. 
In other words, if you're an elder in this church, it doesn't mean that you're an elder in every other church that you go to. You're appointed in this particular place, and you operate as an elder here, and you operate in team. The fourth thing that we can see from this verse is that elders were appointed for the benefit of the church, not for their own benefit. Now that goes without saying, and we'll have a look at that in more detail just now. So that's the first verse that I want to go to. And uh, let's move on to the next one, Acts chapter 20. And here we see Paul speaking to the elders at Ephesus. And if we have a look at verse 28, he says to the elders, Keep watch over yourselves and all of the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God which he bought with his own blood. There's a lot of truth in this passage. So today is more a Bible study, word study. So I hope that that's okay with you guys. Um, rather than a sermon, we literally are wanting to study and have a look at words and passages. So in this passage, we find a number of things. I mentioned them briefly last night, but I want to go over a few things. The first thing that we see is that elders are appointed by the Holy Spirit. It says there, of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Now I want to talk a little bit about that, which means elder cannot be a committee that is voted on because of your stand in society or anything like that. It is, it is a wonderful thing that elders are chosen by the Holy Spirit and need to be anointed by the Holy Spirit for the task of caring for the flock. Because that's the word that's mentioned here. They are appointed by the Holy Spirit. And so, when we read later in Timothy, we find that elders that is referred to were ordained publicly through prayer and fasting and the laying on of hands because there was an anointing that came upon elders. And an anointing from God means the power of the Holy Spirit to let you do what He's called you to do that you couldn't do in your human ability. That's what the anointing means in a practical sense. It's the power or the equipping of the Spirit coming upon you so that you can do what you are called to do, not by human strength, but by the power of the Spirit. So elders need to be ordained publicly because as they prayed for what in the appointing, like we saw in Acts 14, as they are prayed for and ordained, there is an entrusting that the Holy Spirit will come upon them as the hands are laid upon them and there's an anointing that comes upon them so that they can serve the church, not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of God. So we need to understand it is a spiritual position by the Holy Spirit. And that is why elders, in a sense, are not just people that are selected on purely on status in society or prominence or all those kind of things. We have to say, if the Holy Spirit's going to appoint them, the Holy Spirit surely must choose them. And so that is why the choosing of elders for a church is not something that is done based on just what the eye can see, which is why we read in Acts 14, they were ultimately appointed through apostolic ministry. So I want to talk just a little bit about how elders are appointed and chosen in a local church. Because the way that I see it happening is that it is a partnership with the local church and the apostolic team to identify, to train and equip, and then ultimately to come to a place of agreement where elders are recognized as these are the elders God has chosen for us in this church, and then to publicly ordain them in front of the church that everybody can see that this is their task. So I want to mention that, the incredible importance of the anointing of God for this task, because to lead God's people, you cannot do it by human strength. You need the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So that we see here, they are appointed by the Holy Spirit. Uh, if we go on with this verse, and it says there, he has made you overseers, and then it says, be shepherds. So there are two words there that we're going to look at in some detail. If I, if I do keep apologizing for the technical things, is that it's not my normal style to do technical teaching. 
But I think in a case like this, I just want to open my laptop. In a, in a case like this, I think it's very important because we're wanting to undo stuff based on what we see in Scripture. So, um, those two words are two words that I want to just study in some detail this morning. So, firstly, let's have a look at the word overseer. It is the word that in some older translations is translated as bishop. And within the second century after the New Testament writings were written, within the second century AD, the term bishop for the first time was separated from the term elder and was then given to the to the person that oversaw a number of churches. And they separated the title, so you'd have elders in the churches, and then you'd have a bishop that is the overseer. There are quite a few denominations that still practice exactly that same principle, but it was not found in the New Testament times, nor was it found in the first few centuries um, after um, the New Testament times. It was something that came later, and so a bishop then became another position. But we do not find that in scriptures. I need to mention that because possibly some of you have come out of a church where you have local church elder and then the, the bishop is kind of the presiding bishop of the city or of the region that we then come. So I come out of a church where that was the case. So, But here we see the elder is the bishop. The bishop is a job description and it has to do with his authority. The authority to exercise discipline and the authority to protect and also the authority to oversee the church as a whole. So one of the things that the anointing does for a person that comes into eldership is that it gives him authority from God. And that is why in numerous places churches are, are told to honor your leaders and to submit to their authority. It's not because they are cleverer, better, um, uh, more successful or anything than anybody else in the church, but because God gives them authority and the authority is to be submitted to never in a lording over way, but it is always for the protection of the flock and to exercise discipline where necessary. And so there's an authority that gets placed on elders that we need to understand. That's why they're called overseers because they have that authority over the flock, but it is never for domineering. We look at that in Peter's writing just now. So we need to see that word overseer. The second word is the word shepherd. Now, this one also has been taken within the first couple of centuries and it was being used as a title. And the title shepherd is a word, there's another word that means shepherd, it's the word pastor. And so what has happened is that this became a term that was used to give the senior elder, so to call, and he was called the pastor, and the rest of the elders were called elders. That development happened early on in church history, but it was never like that in the New Testament. In fact, the title giving where we address somebody as pastor is not found in the Bible. Even Paul, who was an apostle, when you read his letters, he never writes there, Apostle Paul. You cannot find it. You can go and look. Even though if anybody deserved a title, it would be Paul. And so many of us refer to Apostle Paul. But you'll never, he never actually ever used that as a title. It was his gift. It was his ministry. And it's the same with be shepherds. It is a verb. It is a doing word that we are to you understand is the job description of the elder. The elder is the office, that is the office, but the, the job description is to oversee and to shepherd or to pastor the flock. It's a verb. So when we want to use pastor as a title, we are using something that I know is very dear to many of us. We've grown up as a sign of respect to the uh, person leading your church and it's a cherished title and it is done with honor and dignity so I'm not trying to knock it but I want to say I believe it causes damage when we want to use titles to show honor to leaders because it's not biblical we need to realize that and so as much as your intention is pure and honorable and good that you want to honor your leaders and call them pastor Paul 
I know your hearts are pure, or reverent so-and-so, or, or whatever. I know the motives are pure in general, but it does harm to the wine skin. It damages the wine skin. Let me tell you why it damages the wine skin. It immediately means that we are using titles to create some sense of separation between the eight team members because we're all part of the eight team. And when we want to use titles, we are like elevating guys out of the team because he doesn't like I'm using Paul as an example. I hope you don't mind. And, I, and I'm not familiar with how this is done yet, but I want to just say this because it comes out of many of our backgrounds. Paul doesn't go around and address you according to your job description. Say, good morning, plumber Joe. Good morning, um, teacher so-and-so. He actually just calls you by your name. But when we do it the other way around, we are creating a kind of a sense of a distinction that shouldn't be there. Yes, they are elders in the church, but they're on the same level. They're in the same team playing the same game. They've just got a different job. Their job is to elder. Your job is to be a saint in the team with them playing the same game. And when we want to elevate them, we create a subtle thing that they are more spiritual than us. They are closer to God and heaven than us. They get superior revelations from heaven than us and it creates damage because we actually are causing division in the team and it shouldn't be and so when somebody says please just call me Alan I'm not trying to be funny I'm not trying to be super humble or show you I actually just say you know what I don't find that in the Bible even Paul said you know Paul, an apostle called by Christ. You see, there's a massive difference. He's describing his gift and his job description. So this is Paul, an elder in the church by the will of God. And you are a saint in this church by the will of God. And we all are equal in this church. It's one body. And it's very, very, very important because, you know, the distinction... And there's a terminology, I don't want to bore you with terminology, but there's a distinction that crept in, in the very early days of the church, and it crept in because of various heresies and all kinds of things. But it was a distinction between the laity and the rest of the the, the leaders of the church. So, and that distinction came in, and it has caused harm to the church for centuries. It allowed, eventually, the division became so much so that we know in church history that there were even times where where people would say to the church, you know, nobody must have the the Bible in their own translation. Only the the learned uh, bishop or whatever can interpret the Bible for you and so on. And the people were persecuted when they wanted to print Bibles into the people's language. We can just hear of people that were put to death for trying to get the Bibles in the hands of the people. That's the extent that this went to when we want to separate the, the clergy and the laity. And we, we, we want to go back there and what, by putting titles on those that are, are put into leadership for the church, we actually are just putting a little bit back. And if you let it Go on through time, eventually it gets to that place. And that also allows leaders to abuse their people, to exercise undue, ungodly authority over them and to control them in ways that was never intended by God. So we need to realize that elders are to be shepherds, not to be called pastor. They are to do shepherding. And the way that you show them respect and honor for their role in the church is by obedience. That's how we show it, not by titles. So I know the motive is pure. That's why I keep, I'm not wanting to embarrass anybody. Perhaps it's your custom and your habit and you've brought up and you feel very rude when you want to address uh, uh, a church leader by their name. And you feel, you know, but I just want to say to you, show your respect to them by the way you obey them. You know, that's how you show it. So, So elders are to shepherd the flock. Now, That word shepherd is a word that is attributed to God himself. 
You remember the most popular psalm in the Bible? I'm guessing it's the most popular. I haven't studied that, but I'm guessing the most popular psalm in the Bible, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. That's where this term comes from. It's a term dear to God because it's who he is. And he gets very angry with shepherds when they don't treat the flock the way he treats them. You find the warnings in the book of Ezekiel, I think it's chapter 37, where he says, I am against the shepherds because they have not gone to bind up the wounded. They have not gone to search for the lost. They have not comforted my people or poured oil on their heads, but they fattened themselves with the flock while they've neglected them. Therefore, I am against the shepherd, says the Lord, and I will come against them and I will appoint one shepherd over them. And that one shepherd is Jesus Christ. He is the shepherd. In John 10, he says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. You know that passage well. But then he says, but the shepherd comes to lay down his life for the flock. So, to be given the job of being a shepherd by God should terrify every one of us. Because it means I'm going to lay down my life for this flock. I will die trying to look after them, if it comes to that. And I will not be like the hireling. You remember in John 10, there's a hireling. There's a thief and a hireling and a shepherd in that chapter. The thief, he will abuse the flock and take what he wants from them by force, or by manipulation, or by fear, or threats. And you get leaders like that. They actually are thieves. And they will twist and manipulate the congregation. That's a thief. And then you get hirelings. They're just doing the job that they paid for. But they will not operate outside of the job description. Now, I don't do generators. No, I'm not paid for that. Uh, I don't do picking up the dishes or the cups after the service. I'm not paid for that. That's the hireling mentality. And then you get the shepherd. And all three of those are, are possible motives for leadership in the church. So one has to ask, you know, what's my motive for, for church leadership? If your motive is like Dalian shared, and I know that's been her motive, and that's how she's lived her whole life in front of the church. She's laid down her life for the flock every day. It's been an example to me that I honor deeply. But that thing that Dalian shared of, can I love the sheep? You know, that's the question. Because when you love the sheep, you know what? I lay down my life for them. And this couple, I've known them for a few years. And I've known... Uh, Avril is here, I know Arnold isn't here, but this couple I've known for a few years and I can say everything I see about them, they've poured out their lives for the flock. They've given their lives through the, the ministry, from what I know, through thick and thin, they've done that. And what I know of, of Avril and Jean as well, uh, one can see that. You guys have got outstanding elders who are living this out in front of you. So that's eldership, Acts 20, be shepherds. Now, I'd like to ask you to go to First Peter, chapter 5. Verse 1. I haven't double-checked my dates, but I think this was written around about, I'm not sure, I think 65 AD or somewhere there. So this was also quite late into the first century church, and he writes to the elders. So Peter was an apostle, but he also refers to himself as an elder. Now that's interesting. So you can be both an elder and an apostle, and that's Interesting, and it's quite true. And what we see is that elders are assigned to a local church. So when Peter was in his local church, he was one of the elders. But yet he had a gift of being an apostle. When he went out of the local church and he went ministering, he was sent out, which is what the word apostle means. He was sent out and he ministered as an apostle. So yeah, he's sent out and he gathers the elders together, or he's, he's sending this letter to the elders and so he refers to them, listen, I know I'm an apostle, but I also want to say I'm also an elder. 
I know what I'm talking about. I've been on the eldership team. He was on the eldership team in Jerusalem. We read about that in Acts chapter 15. He was there. And, uh, and here we see he's an apostle, but also an elder. And so he says, to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder. So that just shows, you know, this title of apostle is wrong. Peter doesn't use it. He just says, I'm a fellow elder with you guys. He's not coming with this fancy billboard of I'm the apostle. He just says, you know, I'm also an elder like you. So you can relate to each other. And he says, and a witness of Christ's suffering who also will share in the glory to be revealed. And he says, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. It's almost word for word what Paul said in Acts 20. And yet again we see the primary role of an elder is to shepherd the flock under their care. That's their job. That's the delight. I'm going to digress this a little bit. I, I, I shared it yesterday, but at a different meeting that we had. But the bottleneck, if God were to see revival released on the earth, the bottleneck will be elders. Because God doesn't want people to be saved and there's no shepherds to care for them. Because that would not fulfill the Great Commission, which is not about getting people saved, it's about getting people to be taught, to become more like Jesus. The bottleneck is elders. And so, when I'm talking about elders here and shepherds, I loved what Shannon shared, is that there might be in this room many people that God is calling to eldership. Maybe not in this church, but into the nations. Because what if God were to bring a flood of revival where we see millions coming to Christ? Who's going to shepherd them? God's going to come look here. God's going to come to South Africa because we don't realize what we've got here. South Africa, I mean, we've just got back from the Netherlands. South Africa has got almost, in a sense, an open heaven when you, have, when you see the number of churches and the depth of people's Christianity, the depth of their maturity in Christ here is unknown in the world, predominant, I'm generalizing. So if God's going to bring revival, he's going to come knocking on the doors of the South African churches and say, hey, go and help, off you go, go and become elders. We have a friend in Switzerland who leads a church there, and she came for my son's wedding some years ago. She basically said this, send us your home group leaders, send us deacons, send us, because those people are more qualified and more equipped to lead churches than anybody we can find in Europe. And so, I just need you to, to hear, when I'm talking about elders, don't dial out and say, oh, I'm never going to be an elder. And, you know, I want to say to Pasop, God might come knocking and say, so please, I want to appeal to all of you here today. Don't hear what Shannon said. Don't think in a confined way of God. God can use you. And he might be in a hurry as well because time is running out. Okay, so sorry, I, I told you I was going to digress, but I, I needed to, to, to share that, that you can start to think beyond just what looking at yourself and your current sense of what you can do. So be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them. That's the same word for overseer, which means you watch over them. The shepherd has a rod and a staff, which are symbols of his authority to care, never to beat the sheep. When you read Psalm 23, the psalmist doesn't say, you know, when I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm more terrified of the shepherd than the shadow of death. Because he's going to clap me with his rod and his staff. You know? No, he says, his rod and his staff, they comfort me. So the rod and the staff, the, the rod is a short thing that he would use to, to beat off any um, wild animal that would come to attack his flock. And his staff, he could use to help keep the sheep on the, on the narrow dark path in the valleys that they don't fall off and land, you know, and fall down the cliff. So they comfort him. Especially when they have to go through perhaps times where it's dark and the sheep can't know the way that the shepherd can use his staff to to, to keep them on the safe path. So we need to realize that that authority, the rod and the staff, the authority is for protection and comfort, never for abuse, manipulation, control, or anything. So that's the heart of it. 
Be shepherds of God's flock that's under your care, watching over them. And here we have Peter's unpacking of this concept of a shepherd. He says, now let's just unpack it. He says, not because you must, not a hireling. You must never become an elder because you feel Paul said you have to. You are going to be an elder. Not because you must, but because you are willing. Which means there must be a deep sense in your heart of the calling of Christ. Like what Dalian said. God has called me and I respond. But because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain. That's important. So there mustn't be other cravings. Don't be a thief that wants to be an elder so that you can get recognition and status and everybody can, can look up to you. That's a thief. That's dishonest gain. But eager to serve. And whatever I've seen in this church, every time I've been here, that's just about everybody I've seen here, there's a willingness to serve. Elders are servants. They're not fancy people that everybody else must serve with a special parking spot and all the kind of things. And um, actually, no, they must be eager to serve. So, eager to serve. Then it goes on. Not lording it over those entrusted to you. So they're not domineering. They don't run the church like this. How do they run it? But being examples to the flock. Now, there was somebody, I can't remember who figured it out, but there's a helpful drawing that, that you can have a leadership model like this, which is the lording over model, where the, where the elder is, is on top here and the flock is underneath and he lords it over them by control and authority and position. He will lead the church. You will listen to me because I'm the elder. Then there was a reaction to that, the democratic model, which is borrowed from governments and stuff. And they turn the thing upside down and through voting and, and all those things, the elder is appointed and the elder is underneath and must ultimately do what the board says he must do. Don't preach on tithing. Okay. Because it's like this. Don't preach on that preach on this or else we fire you See, that's that way around that's also not and then you have this lead by example which means God's given me authority but I'll not lord over the people nor will I let the people lord over me but how I will live is I will lead by example so you turn that thing on its side so elders in that picture it's a lovely picture are those that walk in front like the shepherds in the Old Testament and the flock follows them, and they lead by example. And if necessary, they've got a rod and a staff to protect and to comfort. They have authority, but they don't use it the whole time to control it. They lead by the example. Their life draws the people. And so they're examples in worship. They're examples in prayer. They're examples in love. They're examples in humility. That's how they, they live. So I've covered some things of the elders, and I want to... Try and avoid going too much at this stage into the qualifications for an elder, but I need to mention that. And then we're going to have a break. I'm not sure what time I started. Can I end at half past? Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Is that fine? You're still okay. I'll take two minutes. The qualification for an elder is in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in Titus chapter 1. They are long, detailed studies on the prerequisites to become an elder. Thank you so much. And so let's just briefly have a look there. First Timothy chapter 3. Verse 1. Here is a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now, the overseer Thanks. is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, <coughs> able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. And he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert 
or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. So there we have Paul writing to Timothy who needs to bring on more elders into the church at Ephesus where Timothy was. And so Paul writes to him and gives him advice. And he says, these are the prerequisites before you start investigating has the Holy Spirit called them, which we spoke about. He says, you must have a look at some things. And I want to briefly sum them up this way. That list that I gave you, not one of them can you find out on a Sunday morning at church. If you go over that list, most people that are in line for eldership don't come to church drunk. Most of them don't show off their love of money on a Sunday. Nor do they, generally they will have some plan in action to make their, their marriage and their, their kids behave sort of well on a Sunday. And all the things listed here, you will not be able to spy out on a Sunday. Having the respect of outsiders, all those kind of things, being respectable. Where do you find them? Where do you go and check up on, is this person a good elder? It's not what you see on a Sunday. You must go and visit them from Monday to Saturday. And those are the things. And so these are not things that are so high and mighty that you've got to be perfect. They are things that Paul wrote to Timothy in a fallen world. Ephesus was a godless city. And so he said, these are the basics that need to be happening. They mustn't be addicted and drunkenness, um, held by drunkenness or, or any form of addiction, whatever it might be. They must have a sense of being a good family. And if their kids are still in the home, and doesn't refer to children that have moved out of the home, children in the home, they must have some exercise of being good parents to their kids. They must have a good reputation at work. In other words, you can, you can in a sense hear from the people that work with them and their bosses at work, do they do a good job at work? Are they faithful? Are they on time at work? Those kind of things. And those are the basics that are to be in place before you start praying about actually can this person possibly be an elder? Children. Um, we've had quite a lot of questions about elders' children. And um, some people say, well, look, I'm an elder, but my child has wandered from God and is, is into all kinds of things. And what we believe this scripture means is when children are under your authority in your home, that you bring them up. And when they're small, in your home, but there comes a time where the authority of the parents over the children is slowly but surely handed to the child who's now becoming an adult to make their own free choices. And for that, the parent cannot be responsible for anymore. So I just want to mention that because a lot of people, we, we've had also some journeys with our children and those kind of things, that there comes a time where they become accountable for their own deeds and it's not the parents. So this particularly refers to younger children in the home with, the, with uh, their parents. And when they start getting into their teenage years and they start making decisions about whether they're going to follow God or not, in the end they are becoming adults with free choice and I believe that that is not what, what Paul was referring to here. So I just mentioned that. So here are some qualifications. I need to stop here. I think uh, that you guys can at least have a bit of a breather. And in the second session I'm going to do deacons briefly and then questions and answers. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to take a break. Thank you so much. And before I progress to deacons, um, uh, I'd just like to come back to something that I ended with about children, because we found over the years that often one of the big reasons why people have um, concerns or even dislike or even reservations to think about being elders or deacons is about their thoughts of their children or perhaps their own history of what it meant to them. We've had some terribly sad stories with people that we've met, not from our church, but where we actually, what they went through as children because their parents were either elders or deacons um, has left 
kind of negative uh, thoughts on them about it. So I just want to say a few things just briefly about that. And so it's not in my notes. This is just something that, that I thought I wanted to mention. Is that we feel very strongly that children of elders and deacons are just children. They're not elders and they are not deacons. They're just children. And I think we must be free with that. They shouldn't be the necessarily the most uh, spiritual children in the children's church. They don't necessarily have to be the most well-behaved kids in the church on a Sunday. They're just children. They have their good days. They have their bad days, whatever. So um, there's just a, a funny story from our, from our kids, you know, because some days we would be at church when our kids were little. We'd be there like sometimes till one o'clock and all kinds of things. And so our kids were playing around just like their lounge, the, the, the church building. It was like their lounge because they spent hours there. And uh, so they got a bit naughty and they started to run on the seats, on top of the seats. But this was after a few hours while we were praying for somebody or doing something. I can't remember what, you know. And um, we got a little bit of kickback from that, you know. Eldest children, you know, they should be just sitting there and, you know, well behaved for hours on end. And we just said to the people, you know what, they've been here for hours. This is like their lounge. And I know we'll talk to them. They shouldn't do that. But they're just kids. And actually just be free. And I, I, I want to emphasize that. And I also want to say when Paul writes about they must manage their household well, I think if your children are out of the home, that changes. You do not have the authority to control your child's choices when they leave home, when they get older. But how then do you be a, a model elder when your children are out of the house or if they've grown up and perhaps it's, it's built into the way that you love them. And I mean, our, our daughter had some back issues and when, when she left home, she was very angry with God and she said to us, I'm not going to go to church and we couldn't control her. But there was a few months in her life where she was so angry with God that she actually uh, was a bit rebellious. And in the end, must I then now resign as an elder because that, but she was already in her 20s or yeah, around there. And, but we believe we didn't want to hide it from anybody or, or, or cover the truth of what was going on. We said, this is who we are. This is what she's going through. Thing. But we will model how do you be a parent to a child that's perhaps not doing exactly what uh, um, a Christian should be doing. And the way we loved her, prayed for her daily, fasted and prayed for her and all those kind of things and kept loving her. And now she's serving Jesus and it's wonderful. She's, she's being used by God. But I just want to say that because I think sometimes people think of this passage about your children and all of that, and you think, well, I'll never, never put my hand up for eldership or deaconship. I want to say, please be free on that. If you bring your children up and you love them and you, you're doing your best to be a good parent and structure in the home and all those things, that's what this is about. It's not that your children must be these perfect saints that are going to just f float into into the next pastors or elders of the church. They might never be pastors or elders themselves. So I hope that just, well, I just want to settle that because I have found in practice that that can be very harmful, especially if parents want to say, you must behave because you're an elder's child. It can leave deep scars on a child's heart. And that's never what one wants to do. Okay, so I just want to say that. I want to quickly talk about deacons. The job description of a deacon is virtually not found in the Bible. So elders have got verses and verses of job descriptions that we've read and studied, but deacons have none. And so we do know it's an office in the church because we find in the passage we read from 1 Timothy 3 that straight after elders, it says, then it talks about deacons being appointed into the life of a church. And we read there in Philippians 1, the elders and the deacons in the team. So deacons are an office, but we are not told what they do. And that might be puzzling, but actually it makes it very simple. Deacons have a particular role is that they rise to the occasion to meet the need in the local church of a particular season, a particular 
unique situations and ministries that are running in the church, they rise to that occasion so they can basically do anything. That's why there's no specific job description because their job description will depend on the church, the situation in the church, the ministries of the church, the involvement of the church, and that's what it is. So when you study what it is to be a deacon, all you basically get is the requirements to be a deacon and what the fruit of their ministry should be in the church. The rest, it depends what you do. You can do anything that carries some responsibility in the church and you can offer that to be a deacon. So the Bible doesn't give descriptions. So, you know, there's not in the scriptures particular mention that a deacon must do this. He must put chairs out on a Sunday, which is sometimes what people's concept is of the deacons. They come and they like just put the chairs out and they do this and they do that. Actually, we don't read it in the Bible, but that could be what a deacon could do. They could also be in the worship team. They could be doing anything, but there's not specifics. So, so I just wanted to make that clear. The, the fruit of their ministry is, is what we do see, and the attitude by which they do that is what's critical. And then it depends on the elders of the church how and where they utilize the office of a deacon. It depends on the elders, where they need, where they see things that need to be taken care of. So for me, the best study that I can find on this is Acts chapter 6, but the word Deacon is not used there in the noun. It's used in the verb form. So they were not particularly referred to as deacons, but most agree this was the unfolding of the first office of deacons is in Acts chapter 6. So this is the passage that I'm going to use to do that. And then I'm going to end just with how all three these offices, the apostolic team, the elders and the deacons work together, and then I'm done. So, let's look at Acts chapter 6. I'm going to read the, um, the first seven verses. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Please, can you just take note that it says there, the disciples were increasing. So, the Great Commission was working, the making of disciples, and the disciples were increasing. And as growth came, it created needs. And there the need is explained, that there was this problem with the widows that were being fed. Verse 2, so the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would be right, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. And that word wait on tables is the, the verb there is the, the word that we get the name deacon from a diakonos. So to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. And we will turn this responsibility over to them. And there's a key that I believe the role of a deacon is to carry responsibility so that other leaders can do other things. And I have a little statement that I want to make here. And this is how the team, the A team works. Is certain people do certain things so that other people can do other things. I know that sounds very simple. But that's exactly the thing. So elders do certain things so that other people can do other things. And deacons do certain things so that elders can do other things so that other people can also do other things. And so the whole body works. And this is the thing. So elders get to a place where they say, we are carrying this thing, but we can actually give the responsibility to somebody else. So that we can do other things that we feel is our higher priority for us. And so they handed this responsibility over. And that is what for me the heart of a deacon is. It is somebody that is recognized as being full of faith, full of the spirit. And is willing to serve even if it's not their ministry. Because when you read about these seven that they chose here. We, we find at least two of them, their ministry was not sitting at tables feeding widows. We see Philip became an incredible evangelist. We see Stephen became one of the most profound preachers. And they were just deacons. 
And it's a, an important thing to see. The deacon is a high office in the church in terms of its weight, in terms of its anointing, and in terms of its influence, and in terms of that. But it is a servant position, just like elders. Just like elders. They're servants. But we mustn't just see deacons as they're the guys that just do mundane jobs and they put the chairs out. Okay, so they are people that the elders trust to that degree that they see the spirit is on them, that they can hand certain responsibilities over them and not have to worry about them again because it's spiritual people carrying responsibilities, even though they might be practical responsibilities. So I think that sums up so much of the heart of being a deacon. Uh, so we've got a deacon in our church, his name's Gerard. And um, we brought him onto the deacon's team. He's one of our worship leaders. And um, I can't quite remember if he does anything else in the church right now, but he's in the Nelspray Church. But he has traveled preaching in churches around the world more than some of our elders. And he's right now packing his bag. He's going to go and minister at three or so churches in the UK. Um, but he's not on our eldership team. Because when he's in town, he's so busy... Um, um, he's a doctor, he works at the government hospital, and he's got long hours and various other things. So we've never brought him onto our eldership team because it would, in a sense, tie him down. But he's a deacon, he leads worship, but then he takes his leave and then he goes and churches invite him to preach there and he's got a prophetic gift and so on. And he's on our deacon's team. So I just want to put that out there that um, we must get out of our heads that deacons are just mundane kind of dust pushers. But their heart is, I'll do anything. I'll do anything, because when you find these guys, we'll find them in verse 5. Let's go on, rather. Um, verse 5. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip. And then there's some names there. Um, but Stephen and Philip are the two that we read more about in the next chapters. If you quickly glance your eye to chapter 7, the heading there is Stephen's speech. And um, it's this whole incredible sermon that he preached uh, to the high priests. And then if you go further on, you find um, how Philip goes into Samaria and brings one of the greatest revivals in the New Testament times, where the whole city turns to Christ through the ministry of one of the deacons. Okay. All right. So they chose these guys. And it says, they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. Now there we again see that the office of a deacon is one that must be done by the anointing. Not just by, he's a good, um, you know, chair setter outer. So we make him a deacon. Actually, they laid hands on them. They select them to be full of the spirit. And then they gave them this very mundane task. That you sit at the table and say, okay. He has your food, he has your food, he has your food. Next, okay, he has your food, he has your food, he has your food. Next, he has your food. And make sure that and things like that. So they gave these people with anointing, but that shows their heart. So um, I think it's very important to see the heart of a deacon is I'll do anything to release others to do what they need to do. And then when God sees the heart, very often that just unlocks his anointing to break open things for you. So I want to say we must aspire to the office of a deacon. I believe it because the reason I say that is that when you read Acts chapter 6, the impact it had on the church and on the city is remarkable. So let's just read on. I want to point it out to you. Can I, can I ask you, sorry to do some Bible gymnastics here. Just look again at chapter 6 verse 1. It says the number of disciples was increasing. Look at chapter 6 verse 7. This is now after the appointing of the deacons. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now, can you see... Chapter, uh, verse 1, there was this problem, but the church was growing, increasing. Pointed to seven deacons. The next verse after the appointing, 
the church grew rapidly, not just increased, rapidly, and they broke into new areas that they hadn't broken into before. What brought it on? Well, my logic says the appointing of the deacons. And what did it do? It released the apostles from certain tasks so that they could focus on other tasks. And it released the anointing through the laying on of hands on these deacons, which actually increased the impact of the church because the Holy Spirit, I believe, empowered those deacons to sort problems out. Because the problem between the, the, the Hellenistic and the, and the Hebrew widows never is mentioned again in the Bible in Jerusalem. We don't find it ever again. My logic says those deacons got in there, sorted out the divisions, which is one to me, what I, when I train our deacons, I say one of the skills you need to have as a deacon is that you don't take sides in the church. If there's division, you sort it out so that at the end, we never hear of that division ever again. It's one of the things that deacons do. They have this heart to bring the church together, to unite the groups together that perhaps are in disagreement. They sort problems out so that elders don't have to rush around doing that, but that they can focus on things that they must do. And if they can do what they should do, we all are blessed and the church increases at a greater level. So that's why to love the thought of being a deacon is a good one. And, you know, I go back to the Old Testament. When the Israelites went into captivity when they were uh, taken out um, and they were taken into Babylon. And after 70 years, they were led back with Ezra and, and um, in the time of Nehemiah and all those people were going back to the promised land and going, you know what? They wanted to go back and they wanted to get the temple up and running again back in Jerusalem. And so when they left Babylon, they said to everybody, look, we're going to go make a big, uh, we're going to leave in a big group. We're going to go together and we're going to take all the implements back with us back to Jerusalem. And when they'd all gathered, they had a look around and they couldn't find any Levites. And they said, where are the Levites? And the Levites hadn't come. And it speaks to me, and I don't want to make too close a parallel between Levites and deacons. That's not a parallel. But the attitude was the Levites had so become comfortable in Babylon that they didn't want to be burdened again with the task of serving as Levites, because it was quite a tough job being a Levite in the temple. I mean, you had to help the priest the whole time with the sacrifice and cleaning up all the blood and all that stuff, and you had to be involved. It was hard work, and you had to you know, work at the temple, do all kinds of things. And those Levites that had been taken out of Israel and were now in captivity in Babylon and found other lives there and learned to be comfortable, they weren't burdened with all that stuff, and they... And actually, so they, they appointed some skilled people to go back to the Levites and to say to them, you know what, you need to come and you need to be involved in what God has called you to do. And sometimes it's a picture in the church, is that sometimes we've got ourselves settled in all kinds of things, that when the call comes to say we need deacons in the church, actually we say, no, I'm quite settled here, thank you very much, and I can live my life here, and don't burden me with extra stuff, and now I must help with this and be at this and all those things. But sometimes we actually need to leave that behind and say, God, what are you saying to me? And to be called and to aspire to be a deacon is a great thing. It's a great task. So I leave that with you. I think there's enough said. The, the requirements to be a deacon are given in 1 Timothy 3. We read the first part of it, so I'm not going to read it again. The laying on of hands we've seen was done by the, the leaders of the church. So I believe deacons are ordained by the elders. Elders are ordained by the apostolic team. I end then with how does this all work together. And I, I believe Ephesians chapter 4 is how this whole wine skin operates. And I know it's not a good term, but in the context that I'm sharing, the disciple-making machine, I know it's bad, a bad term, but I just want to use it now. The disciple-making machine, the wine skin, is the local church. I'm not against discipleship courses, but discipleship, making disciples, is the task of the whole church. It's not some guy going off, taking a couple of people and saying, I'm going to disciple them. Because if you look at your own body, how does your body grow? Which is what discipleship is. Your body doesn't grow by separating people off. You need all the organs influencing each other the whole time for your body to grow. 
And so it's vitally important that we realize that everybody in the A-team is part of the discipleship-making machine. We all are involved in seeing one another becoming more like Jesus. And that doesn't mean you don't have discipleship training and all those things. I'm not against that. But I'm saying, if you want to see, let's say, person X that comes to church here, if you want to see person X discipled and becoming more like Jesus, they need to be exposed to all of you over time and all of your influence in their life. You're going to have different impacts at different times, meaning different things to them. And it's like the whole body feeding that thing, like the liver and the heart and the kidneys, all feeding everything. And then somewhere in the body, you have a little finger that is now thriving because all the parts of the body are influencing the finger. So this little finger can grow and do its job and vice versa. So here's the summary. Local church governed by elders who carry the governmental oversight of the church. Deacons who are appointed by the elders to carry responsibilities on their behalf are spirit-filled, faith-filled people that are willing to serve anywhere, but who can have massive ministries, even bigger ministries than the elders. Deacons. Translocal ministries, which is Ephesians 4, which is where I'd like to end this passage. Let's just go there. Translocal ministries bring gifts into the church from time to time, To equip the saints that the body can do its work. So let's end with that scripture and then questions. Ephesians 4, to me, is a precious, precious chapter that tells us how the body works and makes disciples. Okay, let's read a couple of verses. Let's start in verse nine, no, verse seven. And to, but to each one of us, so a team, each one in the team, each one of us, grace has been given. Everyone in the church has been given something, some grace has been given to everybody. Okay? This is why it says, he ascended on high, he took many captives and he gives gifts to his people. Uh, when he, what does it he ascended mean that he has descended to the lower earthly regions uh, I'm just reading this quickly to get to where I want to he who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe verse 11 so Christ himself gave the apostles the prophets the evangelists the pastors and teachers that is often called the fivefold ministry or the fourfold ministry or the translocal ministry, apostolic team, whatever you want to call it. But they are gifted people that are assigned to the churches to serve into them. And verse 12 says what their task is, to equip the people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. That word, body built up, is the Great Commission objective. To be built up to become like Jesus. That's what it means to make disciples. Okay? So how does discipleship work? In local church that is being influenced through gifted ministers who come into the church from time to time and through the church operating as the wineskin. And then it goes on and it says, Until we all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. That's the aim of discipleship is maturity. To become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So there we have it, the wineskin working together. So um, there's so many things. I can literally think of a whole lot of things in my head that I haven't said. But I think it's, just, it's, it's better to stop and then to answer a few questions because maybe that would address um, particular thoughts that, that that are, are, are going on in your mind right now.